Good morning, GCBC Middle School. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue to learn about Jesus, his life, his death, and how it impacts us and the early church. So let's jump right in. All right, I'm going to share my screen with you, and then we can start our discussion. All right, so the first slide uh, we're looking at is according to Webster's Dictionary, sacrifice is the act of giving up something of value for sake of something else regarded as important or worthy. So let's take a minute and let's just think about this. What do you think of when you hear the word sacrifice? Um, do you possibly think about athletes, maybe a famous athlete, maybe they had to give up junk food for a specific diet, sleeping in for early practices, working out instead of going to events with friends, or even not being able to stay at home as much as they might like because they have to travel for games and for events. Maybe we think about, uh, especially after 2020, doctors, nurses, and other medical staff. Maybe they had to give up buying things that they may want to save for their tuition, hanging out with friends instead of um, hang, giving up hanging out with friends and to study, and years of their lives in school so they can take care of us when we're sick. Um, or maybe we think about family members or friends of family or just in general. Maybe we think about a soldier, a firefighter, or a police officer. Time away from family and friends, training how to protect and serve, specifically New York City and the United States of America. Everyone at some point in their life sacrifices something for the greater good, but nothing so detrimental as what Jesus did for us. Jesus knew from when he was young that he would be the ultimate sacrifice for God's creation. Luke writes about Jesus's life from the start to finish, even sharing how, sac how scared and grieved Jesus was before his death so much that he cried blood and called out to his father to have another way to save his father's creation. Ultimately, Jesus knew he was the key to our salvation and sacrificed himself for us. Let's take a look at the Bible Project video about what Jesus did for us. We've been looking at the story of Jesus as it's told in Luke's Gospel. It begins with the arrival of an unlikely king born in poor, humble circumstances. Then we saw Jesus as a teacher, prophet. He went throughout Israel calling people to a radical way of life, where enemies become friends, the poor are cared for, where people find forgiveness for their failures. He went from town to town inviting people to follow him and live under God's reign in this upside down way. And he did many signs and wonders. So many Israelites began to hope that he would rescue Israel from the Romans and set up a new kingdom of peace and justice. In short, that he would bring the kingdom of God. Now the religious leaders of the day were also hoping for God's kingdom. But to them, the message of Jesus was a threat. Yeah, they had expected to gain power and prestige when this all went down. But Jesus said God's kingdom belongs to the poor, to the outsider, and that real power is serving others in love. This conflict intensified when Jesus, while in Jerusalem, disrupted the temple sacrifices and called Israel's leaders a gang of rebels. So they arrested Jesus, and they had him accused before the Roman authorities of being a rebel king. He was handed over for execution, even though he was innocent. Then he was taken outside the city and put to death on false charges. This brings us to the final section of the Gospel of Luke. 
There was a religious leader named Joseph who opposed Jesus's execution and then requested to be given his body so he could bury Jesus in a nearby tomb. And then a couple of days later, some women who had followed Jesus came to visit that tomb and they found it open and empty. And they encountered these mysterious figures telling them Jesus was alive from the dead. So they run away terrified. Nobody believes their report. I mean, he can't be alive. They all saw him die. Now, just outside of Jerusalem, a pair of Jesus's followers were leaving the city, traveling on a road to a town called Emmaus. And they were sad and confused about everything that had happened. Then Jesus shows up walking alongside them, but they don't know it's him. Yeah, that's weird. Why couldn't they recognize him? Yeah, it's an odd but really significant image for Luke. They're blind to Jesus for some reason. So Jesus asks them, what are you guys talking about? And they begin to tell him about Jesus, a powerful prophet who they expected would rescue Israel, but was instead executed. Some women say he's alive, which is crazy. It's all too much. We're going home. So Jesus tries to explain that this is what the Jewish scriptures had been pointing to all along that Israel needed a king who would suffer and die as a rebel on behalf of those who actually are rebels. And then he would be vindicated by his resurrection so he could give true life to those who would receive it. But it's still not making sense. They're as confused as ever. Which leads to the scene where they sit down for a meal with Jesus. He takes the bread, he blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them, just as he did at the Last Supper. Yeah, this is the image of his broken body, his death on the cross. And it's when they take in the broken bread, that's when their eyes are open to see Jesus. Then he disappears and the episode's over. So this is a story about how it's hard to see Jesus for who he really is. Yes, this is brilliant. I mean, how could God's royal power and love be revealed through this man's shameful execution? How could a humble man become the king of the world through weakness and self-sacrifice? It's very hard to see. But this is the message of the Gospel of Luke. It takes a transformation of your imagination to see it and embrace Jesus' upside-down kingdom. The Gospel of Luke ends with Jesus and all of his disciples together over another meal. And everyone's freaking out about his resurrected body. I mean, he's still a human, but way more. Yes, he's passed through death and come out the other side, a walking, talking piece of new creation. And then Jesus tells them that he's going to give them the same divine power that sustained him so they can go out and share the good news of God's kingdom with other people. After this, Luke tells us that Jesus was taken up into heaven, which is a cool exit and all, but why disappear into the sky? So in the Old Testament, the skies are the place of God's throne. They're above everything. So this is Luke's way of showing that Jesus has been enthroned as the divine king of the whole world. His followers stay in Jerusalem, worshiping God and Jesus, waiting for this new power. And this is where the gospel ends. Now, Luke is going to write about how they receive this power and take the news out into the world. And that's what his second volume, the book of Acts, is all about. We okay, so even after Jesus died, a horrible death, was buried and rose again. He wanted to comfort his disciples and provide them with the teachings that would help them spread the word of God and eventually start the early church. Oftentimes when people think of a church, they think of the actual building. But in actuality, the church is the people who worship in the building. Studying the Bible grows stronger in the Lord. Luke also wrote the book of Acts and explains how the early church came to be. This is an ancient Israelite festival it's during the early summer, and thousands and thousands of Jewish pilgrims would come back to Jerusalem from all over the world, all these different languages and cultures colliding in the city. And the disciples are together in a house, which is suddenly filled with rushing wind along with fire. 
fire splinters off into tongues of fire hovering over people's heads. What's this all about? Yeah, so Luke is tapping into a repeated Old Testament theme. When God's presence showed up similarly at Mount Sinai, he made a covenant with Israel and gave them the Ten Commandments. Then later, when God's glory came in a pillar of fire, it filled the tabernacle when he came to live among them. That was just one pillar of fire, not many. Exactly. Luke's making an important point here. This is God's personal temple presence, God's spirit that was foretold by Israel's prophets. And now it's come to take up residence in the new temple of Jesus' body, that is, his people. They've become little mobile temples where God now dwells. And they start to tell stories about Jesus, but they're speaking in languages that they didn't know before, yet all the visitors can understand them. What's this all about? Well, Peter gets up to explain that this is the fulfillment of Israel's hopes based on the scriptures. God's plan was always to use the unified family of Abraham to bring peace and justice to the world. But the tribes of Israel had been scattered because of the exile. Now here at Pentecost, representatives from all of the tribes come back together and they're introduced to their Messiah, the crucified and risen Jesus, so they can now become the restored people of Israel. And thousands of them start following the way of Jesus. Which brings us to Luke's tale of two temples. So you've got the temple that Herod built in Jerusalem where Jesus' disciples worship like the rest of the Israelites. But now there's also Jesus' temple which consists of people. This temple's meeting together in homes all over Jerusalem and they were approaching life in a radical new way. Right, think about it. Many of these pilgrims aren't even from Jerusalem. So they formed these new families and they're all depending on each other. Yeah, people would sell their stuff, provide for the poor among them. They ate their meals together. They said their daily prayers together. They were learning from the apostles what it meant to live as if Jesus is the true king of the world. And it must have been exhilarating. Okay, so since we are considered the mobile temples of the Lord and um, how can we apply what the early church learned and did to now that we live in 2021? Uh, the scripture says in Acts 2, 42 through 47 that they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. So in 2021, this can look like attending church, reading the Bible, having a devotion, or even listening to praise and worship music. They eat together and fellowshiped with people who love Christ. Inviting someone to share a meal and getting to know them is basically a building block to just building a relationship. So even if that person doesn't know Christ, you can still get to know them and they can see your love and Christ's love through you. They pray together, taking any amount of time to pray and let God know how you feel. Now, I know this can be difficult for people. It can be difficult for me. Um, but even if you're walking to school or riding the bus, or you know what, even in the bathroom, you can talk to the Lord. Um, they sold their possessions and shared what they had with others. Now we can also share with others uh, who may be in need within our church and we can also share in the community. Um, if you see someone who may be homeless, you can buy them a meal. Um, if you see someone who is kind of down and out on their luck, uh, you know, you can find some way to bless them and help them out in that situation. All right, guys, this is uh, the end of this video and we'll be looking forward to seeing you in person next week with Mr. Josh. Have a great week, guys. Bye-bye.